Good morning, everyone. We are so excited to have you joining us today for Scientists in Action, Super Sauropods, Fantastic Fossils. I'm your host, Kate, from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, where we are broadcasting live from a very exciting, very special place, because not many people get to see this when they visit the museum. We are, in fact, in our paleo prep lab, one of the first places fossils visit when they come to the museum. We also have two amazing scientists who are going to be joining us today. And before I introduce them, there's a couple housekeeping items I want to take care of. First and foremost, if you're going to be our on-camera schools, I'm going to ask that you stay muted and off camera until we're ready for you in about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, if you are not going to be on camera and you have questions, I love it. We have an open chat. So students, teachers, however you have those computers are set up, go ahead and be adding those questions to the chat throughout the program, and we'll make sure our scientists get them. So on that note, I would love to introduce Natalie Toth and Alex Polich. Um, could you maybe tell us a little bit about yourselves and also this incredible space we're in? I cannot wait to hear more. So take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kate. So good morning, everyone. Just as Kate said, my name is Natalie Toth, and I am a paleontologist and fossil preparator here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. So my job really has two parts to it. The first part of my job is going out to the field, going exploring and collecting fossils. And the second part of my job is everything that happens to those fossils thereafter. So we bring them back here to the museum, we clean them, we stabilize them, and then we get them ready for research or to put in our exhibits or to be used for educational purposes. So one of the uh, coolest spots about you guys joining us here today is that the coolest thing about you guys joining us today is that we are in this really awesome space that Alex and I work in almost every single day, which is called the Dirty Prep Lab. And we'll talk more about that in just a sec. I'm going to pass it on over to Alex. Yeah. Tell you a little bit about herself. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Alex Polich. I'm a paleontology intern here at Denver Museum, and I've had the amazing opportunity to learn a lot of stuff from Natalie. So I've been out in the field with her where I've learned how to identify fossils that are still in the ground and be able to collect them and bring them back here. I've also gotten to learn a lot about our sauropods, which are our long neck dinosaurs, which we'll get to talk about a lot today. And I've been learning different prep techniques and how to work with different fossils from all over the Rocky Mountain West. So we're so excited to talk to you today. But before we get into too much cool content, we actually have questions for you in the classroom. So if you could go ahead and pull one of our poll questions, we would love for you to guess, how do you think sauropod dinosaurs get their names? Does sauropod mean long net, lizard footed, eats plants, or land whale? One of these is correct. And I want you to go ahead and place your best guess what sauropod means. All right, go ahead and place your vote if you have not done so already. What does the word sauropod mean? How did those dinosaurs get that amazing name? All right, let's go ahead and end that poll and see how our friends did. Oh, okay, it looks by and large, everyone has said long neck, but we do Ooh. have a number of votes for the other three. Um, is there a right answer? What does sauropod <laughs> translate to? Where does this name come from? So I feel like sauropod, it's kind of, this is kind of a trick question, if we're being honest. Um, so lizard foot is the correct answer. However, so many of you guessed long neck dinosaur, and that is exactly what a sauropod is. It's a long neck dinosaur. So great guesses on your guys' end. Um, so sorry for the, the trick question, though. <laughs> we got you. We have another trick question, actually, and we're going to pull this one up. This one's pretty goofy. Um, if we could go ahead and pull our second poll question up, we would like you to make your best guess regarding the sauropod's weight. But the units that we're going to use are a little unusual. So specifically, Argentinosaurus could have been up to 90 tons, 180,000 pounds. Is this equal to 1,000 humans, 200 grizzly bears, 100 giraffes, or 14 African <laughs> elephants. These are some big animals. So go ahead and as a class, place your votes. What do you think is the correct answer for this? All right, and let's go ahead, place your vote and let's go ahead and close that poll. 
How did our friends do? Whoa, okay, oh. it looks like uh, no one voted for grizzly bears. <laughs> um, a, a couple of people said a thousand humans. One said 100 giraffes, but by and large, everyone said 14 African elephants. What is the correct answer? Do y'all know? What is it? <laughs> You guys got it right. It is 14 African elephants. So these long necked dinosaurs were huge. If you can think about how big an elephant is and then having 14 of those, these guys were very big animals. <laughs> awesome. Awesome job. Well, um, let's hear maybe about these gigantic animals then. Tell us a little bit about maybe what's behind you and this, this cool space where you study them. Great. So um, as we mentioned earlier, we are in a behind the scenes place in the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. It's called the Dirty Prep Lab or the Oversized Prep Lab. And this room is so special because this is where our largest field jackets or fossils come from uh, while we're working on them to clean all the dirt off. So some of the really amazing specimens that we brought behind us here today are all from long neck dinosaurs with the exception of one. And you guys may have noticed that we have this guy on the table here. So this is not from a long neck dinosaur, but this would have been a critter that would have been eating our long neck dinosaur. It's called Marshosaurus. Um, so in this space, some of the things in here that make it really special are some of the things that you guys may not recognize right away. Um, I guess if we look over to the side here, over to my right, uh, these are our giant snorkels. And you can think of these as just massive vacuums that help us to collect dirt and dust as we're scraping all of the dirt and sand off of the surface of the fossils. Uh, we also have really specialized tools in this lab, and some of those are behind me here too. These tools are called air scribes, and they work just like a miniature jackhammer. So if you guys listen carefully, you might be able to hear me turn this thing on. <laughs> and we use this tool, just as I had mentioned, just like a little jackhammer, and it helps us to really carefully remove the rock and the dirt off the surface of a fossil without actually damaging the fossil itself which is really, really important because these fossils are about 150 million years old. So we have to be really, really careful with them. Um, the last thing that I'll point out that's over kind of on my end here is you guys may have noticed this giant white blob that's sitting here behind me. Um, this big white blob is what we call a jacket. And you can think about how you put a jacket on to protect yourself from the cold. We put jackets on top of fossils that protect them uh, as they're in transport or moving around to get from point A to point B. So whether that's from the field back to the museum or this jacket here, we're getting ready to flip the fossil over and we want it to be supported as it's getting flipped. So this thing is made out of plaster and burlap and it hardens just like how a cast on your arm would harden to protect your arm if your arm bone is broken. And what we're gonna do next is get ready to flip this giant field, this giant jacket over so that we can start working to prepare or scrape the dirt and the mud and the sand off the other side of this fossil. So I'm gonna throw it over to Alex and see if Alex has anything exciting she wants to share with you guys in this space. So as Natalie mentioned, our books are super, super old. That makes them kind of fragile, even though you can see they're very big. So we have them stored in these white things and they're very similar to the jackets that Natalie showed you, but these are called archival cradles. And these are kind of like a home for the fossils where we store them in our collections. And over to my left here, I actually have a giant sandbox and that's where we're able to make these archival cradles. So you can see we're actually currently in the process of making some in here. What we use is we use foam to cover the fossils so that there's something soft for the fossil to lay in. And then we use the plaster and fiberglass to reinforce it and make it really strong for the fossils to be safe. So that's why we have them in these beautiful cradles made here by awesome volunteers here at the museum. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I would love to show you guys some of the really cool fossils that we have on the table for you all today. Um, and I guess if I can ask you guys a question, one thing I'm curious about is, do you guys think we have long neck dinosaurs that have been found in Colorado? <laughs> that is a great question. This is a great time to utilize that chat. <laughs> so if you want to go ahead and post in the chat, we will be able to see your answers. Oh, we have one class say yes with an exclamation point. <laughs> Here's another yes. Yes, because of Pangea. Oh, and enthusiastic wow. yeses. Awesome. You guys are all correct. So we do have long neck dinosaurs in Colorado, and some of them have even been uncovered not too far from this museum here in Denver. 
So if some of you folks have ever visited um, southeastern Colorado, down by an area called Comanche National Grasslands, there is a treasure trove of long-necked dinosaur fossils that have been recovered from that area. Also over in Cannon City, um, there's been a really productive dig that the folks at this museum worked during the 1990s. And we recovered not only long-necked dinosaurs from that dig area, but meat-eating dinosaurs and the iconic Colorado State fossil Stegosaurus was also uncovered there. So some of these fossils behind me here are also from Colorado. So I had mentioned going down to southeastern Colorado in an area called Comanche National Grasslands or down by La Junta, if you guys have heard the name of that town before. Um, and this big giant bone that's on the back of the table here, this is one single rib bone that was collected from that area. And if you guys can use, I guess, my hand or my arm as a sense of scale, you can see that this thing is about five feet long. So you can imagine how gigantic this dinosaur would have been when it was walking around in Colorado about 150 million years ago, which I think is pretty remarkable. Um, another fossil that's from that area that I think is pretty interesting and exciting is this. Now, if you guys are looking at this, you might be like, what the heck? This just looks like <laughs> a rock, right? This isn't a very beautiful fossil, but there's something really special about this fossil. And you guys can see that it has all of these different striations along the sides of it here. And if I can use Kate's help one more time, I'm wondering if you guys have a guess as to what this little arrow or what these little parallel lines might be on the side of the fossil here. And we hope you guys can see it okay at your school. Go ahead and place your bet in the chat. What do you think <laughs> caused or created these lines? What are those lines on the side of this otherwise um, fairly normal looking fossil? I see one that says a footprint, mm, strata, layers of something, teeth, mm, tail mm, bone, bite mark, teeth, ribs, veins or muscles, eye, skin, flesh. <laughs> awesome. A lot of diverse answers. Um, shells. Oh. Heart. All right. What's the, cool. what's the real answer? So this fossil is so special because some of you had mentioned bite marks, and that is exactly what we're seeing on the edge of this tailbone from a long neck dinosaur. So this is a great clue that these dinosaurs weren't just living alone right down in southeastern Colorado. They had dinosaurs really similar to this meat eating dinosaur that would have been walking around with them and feeding on them as prey. Um, we also sorry one other thing I'll show you guys on here that was also collected from that site. That's another clue that it wasn't just long neck dinosaurs are we actually have some teeth here from those meat eating dinosaurs that would have been. Uh, preying on these animals down in southeastern Colorado. Really cool. You guys can see how shiny and sharp they are. And I don't know if you guys will be able to see it on the camera here, but there's actually little serrations. It looks like the side of a steak knife on the edge of the tooth, which I think is pretty neat. Cool. All right. I'm going to turn it over to Alex. I can talk about dino teeth all day, but I won't. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep on this theme. So we have our meat eating dinosaurs that were eating maybe our long neck dinosaurs, but we also have a really cool fossil here. That's actually a plant fossil. So we have an example of what our long neck dinosaurs might have been eating. And this is an example here of some different fern leaves. <laughs> Hopefully you guys can see the giant leaves in here. Get some different. Yeah. So these are impressions of the, the different leaves that these dinosaurs might have been eating. And something else that's really amazing, in my opinion, that we have here, it isn't exactly a fossil. You might look at this and wonder, why is she showing me a box of rocks right now? But these are actually something called gastroliths. And similar to some birds, sauropod dinosaurs would actually eat different rocks. And they would have these in their stomach and these would actually grind up their food. So they didn't actually have to chew their food, which is one of the reasons they were able to eat so much food and get so big. So they kind of look like river stones because they were in the stomach. So they got nice and smooth. So I want to go ahead and just bring attention back to that to clarify. So these dinosaurs were not chewing food. They were swallowing it whole along with rocks and the rocks inside them would essentially chew up the food. Exactly. That is wild. That's really cool. <laughs> How do you even recognize something like that when you see it in the field? How do you know if it's a fossil or a rock, for example? Yeah, that's a really good question. So with the rocks like this, they're really smooth. Like I mentioned, like those river stones. Um, and this is in an area where there's not currently flowing water. The quarries that we're in are super dry. So we're able to recognize 
recognize these rocks pretty easily. They're usually associated as well with dinosaurs that we're currently uncovering in the field. There's also been some really cool research that's been done with people analyzing these different gastroliths or stomach stones and that we have inferred or guessed or hypothesized is a better word, I suppose, <laughs> that these long neck dinosaurs were probably migrating from across North America when they were alive. And what's really neat is we'll find these stomach stones and there'll be rocks that you can only find in an area like Texas, but we'll find these polished stomach stones all the way up in a state like Montana. So we can make a guess that these dinosaurs may have been traveling or migrating um, and carrying these rocks in their belly with them as they're on these migratory routes, which I think is super interesting. It's hard to explain how a rock would get all the way from Texas up to Montana. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so speaking of Montana, I, I do want to ask this last question before we have student questions. Where do we all find these amazing fossils? How did they get to the museum in the first place? I am so glad you asked. <laughs> so... <laughs> um, Fossils get found in a few different ways. So we found fossils um, as a result of construction that's been happening. So sometimes we'll get calls if something like a bulldozer might be bumping into a dinosaur bone if they're building something really large or extravagant. Um, someone from the museum will go out and check the site and say, oh my goodness, you bumped into a dinosaur bone. But most of the things that we have on this table, what we were doing was out uh, looking with intention of finding and collecting dinosaur fossils. So these are all from a rock unit called the Morrison Formation. And I think Alex and I have mentioned a few times, it's about 150 million years old. So these fossils that are all black in color that are behind me here, these were collected in Wyoming in just the last few years. Whereas the ones that are kind of this tannish color and the one that I showed you with the bite marks that we were looking at earlier, those are all collected from Colorado. But what's really special about the Morrison Formation is it's a really, really extensive rock unit. You can collect these, uh, these types of dinosaurs from the Morrison Formation all the way up north in states like Montana and North Dakota and all the way down to northern Mexico. So if you're in kind of the Rocky Mountain West, there's a good chance you could go out and dig up a long neck dinosaur fossil. I think we actually even have some photos of y'all in the field, right? Because mm -hmm. what does that field environment look like? Yeah, so I had the coolest opportunity to go out with Natalie back last year to Wyoming, where we have these black dinosaur bones. And we were out in the quarry and digging up these different fossils. So you can see some of these pictures. We have a lot of different tools on the site with us. And you might be wondering, what's going on there in the middle with all these people laying on the ground. Um, but one of the things that we do when we find the really, really big bones like we do with long neck dinosaurs is we have to kind of cut underneath the fossil, almost making like a little pedestal for it so that we can jacket it. Similar to that jacket you saw in the lab earlier, that's how we protect the fossil and how we are able to flip it over onto that jacket. Um, so they're currently undercutting it, getting it ready to flip over, and then we'll close up the jacket and bring it back here to the museum where we're able to work on it in a more safe environment. Oh my goodness, <laughs> I love this photo. So these are two of our interns that we had last year here at the museum, Joseph and Maddie, and they were in charge of getting this giant shoulder blade stabilized, repaired, and ready for researchers to use. And I love this photo because the scapula is just over seven feet long. And it, you can imagine, you know, our shoulder blade is just right on the right and left sides of our back. And this shoulder blade, holy smokes, is a huge one that really speaks to the scale of these dinosaurs. <laughs> so this is actually a photo that I took of Natalie and that intern Joseph that was in the previous photo. So this is when they've actually uncovered some bones very recently. So Natalie is using a paintbrush in the field to brush away some of the debris so that we can get to the bone without damaging it. Um, I think currently they're uncovering a tibia, which is a limb bone of a long neck dinosaur. Nice. <laughs> Wow, I feel like Alex should almost talk about it. So Alex worked on this fossil uh, <laughs> for a long period of time. So these are two bones that are the right and the left hip bones from some of these long neck dinosaurs from Wyoming. So you can see they have that beautiful jet black color. Um, and this is just a really perfect example of what these fossils look like right when they're going into collections and getting ready for research. 
These are amazing photos. These are so exciting. I'm so jealous. I wish I could go to the field with you. <laughs> that is amazing. Um, at this point, I would love to go ahead and invite some student questions. And I see um, some people are posting in the chat, but we do have a couple on camera schools. So at this point, I would love to go ahead and invite Telluride Middle School or Intermediate School from Nancy Swift's class to go ahead and unmute and join us on camera. Um, and we're having a little bit of a, a, a technical issue in that our scientists won't be able to hear, but I will be able to hear questions. So you are gonna have to be nice and clear when you ask those questions for the camera so I can translate them for our scientists. <laughs> but we can't wait to see you on camera. You can go ahead and unmute and ask your questions. Okay. Um, I wanted to know why the bones are black. Well, the one why that you saw the there. bones black. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So what's really neat about fossils is that they take on the color of the rocks in which they are fossilized in. So you'll notice that we have fossils on this table that are two main colors. Some are black and some are kind of this tan cream color. Um, and that just has to do with the different minerals that are in the rocks that are um, preserving these fossils. And what's really special is in our collection, we have fossils of so many different colors. Some of them are pink, some of them are completely white, some of them are dark chocolate brown, and it really just depends on what those minerals are in the ground. That's cool. That was an awesome question. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go ahead back to the classroom. It looks like we have some more friends with questions. What's your question, my friend? Um, how do you know if the rock traveled in the dinosaur's stomach? I love that question. How do we know if the rock traveled in a dinosaur's stomach? <laughs> you know, yeah. um, that's a really good question. So are you, um, I, I assume you're talking about these stomach stones or these gastroliths. Yeah. And I feel like Alex talked a little bit about this, how the rocks look really <clears throat> shiny and polished. Um, something else that speaks to that is we'll have fossils that we find of long neck dinosaurs, and they'll be um, all in their kind of life pose, right, from the tip of the nose to the tip of their snout. And we'll find a high concentration of these stomach stones in the area of the dinosaur's body where its stomach would have been. And so these aren't necessarily just random rocks that we find in the quarry. Sometimes they're actually concentrated in little pockets where the dinosaur's belly would have been. Yeah. That's Ooh, context clues. <laughs> context clues, exactly. That's very cool. <laughs> Let's get another question from Telluride. Um, how do you know what areas the dinosaur bones are usually in? How do you know the areas that the dinosaur bones are usually in? Are you talking about where they're found, like in the ground yeah. or in relation like, to like a skeleton? How do you really guess the area? Or do you just guess and kind of keep looking? Uh, so like in the ground, when you're looking for dinosaurs, how do you know where they're going to be? Do you just kind yeah. of dig and look for them? How do you find them? How do you know where to look? That's a really good question. So a lot of the time when we're, if we go out there specifically to look for dinosaur bones, um, we'll kind of have our dinosaur eyes on where we'll be scanning the ground. But a lot of the time we'll see kind of bones crumbling out of the surface. So we'll know, okay, there's bones in this area and that's kind of a sign for us to go in and explore a little bit. And sometimes it's nothing and that's all that there is, but then sometimes you find stuff like the awesome fossils behind me. So one example of a fossil that we found recently, we were kind of walking around in these different areas in Wyoming, and we knew that there were fossils in this area because we were in the Morrison Formation. And so we were scanning the ground, looking for different bones. Um, and something that's really awesome about the black bones is that they're a little easier to spot on the surface. Um, sometimes it can be a little bit harder, but we found a giant hole in the ground and we were able to walk up to it because we had found bones leading up to it, kind of just crumbles of bone. And we looked in and there was this giant piece of a leg bone in this hole in the side of the mountain. So you can find them in all different sorts of places, but usually we find little, kind of like a little trail that leads us towards where we're able to find the fossils. That sounds like the best kind of treasure hunt. <laughs> Also, I, I have to say, Natalie and Alex are making it sound much easier than it is. <laughs> I have gone hiking with paleontologists, and when I see rocks, they see fossils. So <laughs> they are very well trained, and they see them quite easily. But I, as a non-paleontologist, cannot. Yeah, a fun little <laughs> trick that we sometimes use that 
was really helpful for me my first time in the field was bone has a spongy tissue on the inside of it and that'll stick to your tongue because it's super super dry so when you add the moisture from your tongue to it it kind of locks on there so sometimes we'll be out in the field and I'll have that same thing we're like is this rock or is this bone and I'll just lick it so <laughs> that can be a hint for you I would not have thought of that it's <laughs> wild and very cool <laughs> what a fun question and fun series of stories that was um let's go ahead and get another question from Belly Ride um my question is like how are these bones still in such good shape after been after they've been sitting in the ground for so many millions of years how are these bones in such good shape after they've been sitting in the ground for millions of years? Oh, that is a fantastic question. So one of the things that makes fossils so special, or one of the conditions, I guess, that has to be so special is that dinosaur fossils have to be buried in the ground very rapidly, very quickly after that animal dies. So you can think about if you've ever gone hiking and seen something like a deer carcass or a cow carcass, and if it's sat out on the landscape, it probably doesn't have any skin. It could be missing some of its bones. The bones could be cracked and crumbly and weathering. But what's really special about these fossils is that when the dinosaur died, it was probably buried right away, preserving all of these fossils in a super intact way, almost entombing them or encasing them in rock kind of just waiting for us to come and find them and uncover them in such a special way. So, um, you know, I feel like that Alex was talking about going out, finding and collecting these fossils. And the truth is, is that it's really special that we're even able to find these things and that we're able to uncover such a special moment in time when these things were buried. Thank you. That is wild. And very um, Great question. Let's get one last question from Telly Ryan. Uh, my question is, uh, how long does the whole process take, like getting them to the place where you cast them and then casting them or putting the jackets on and then you take them to the museum? How long does that all take? Like in total? Oh, this is a great question. How long does the whole process take? We're talking like finding it, digging it out of the ground, putting a jacket on it, taking it to the museum, everything. How long does this process take? Yeah. yeah, that is a really good question. Um, so it kind of depends on what bones we're working with. Something like this tail that we have here might take a lot longer because there's more bones that we're digging up with this jacket. But something like this toe over here might be a little quicker. So we have this sauropod toe here. Um, but one example that I can give from my internship is when I first started, I started in May. And I was given this ginormous jacket that was you had to be in this room because it was so big. And we got to working on it. And it wasn't until October that we had taken all of the bones out of this jacket and were able to fully prep them and make the cradles for them. Um, and we had, I think, over 40 bones that came from this one ginormous jacket. So it kind of depends on how many fossils there are that you have collected within one uh, field jacket and how big the fossils are, as well as how soft the rock is. Sometimes we have really, really hard rock that takes a lot longer to get off of the bones. And sometimes we have a lot softer rock, like a mudstone, that's a little bit easier and doesn't take as long. That's an awesome question. Thank you. That was a great question. At this time, I would like to invite another school to join us on camera. So Bridgeport Elementary, if you want to go ahead and unmute your mic and join us on camera, we can't wait to hear your questions too. How can you tell how old the dinosaur bones are? How can you tell how old the dinosaur bones are? Do you mean in their life, like if they are a teenager versus an adult, or do you mean how old they are in terms of geology and layers of rock that they're in? Like as far as, as, far as how old um, the actual dinosaur is, as far as like a teenager, child, or adult. It's how old the dinosaur itself was. So if it was a teenager or an adult or, oh, that's a great question. So what's so cool about dinosaur fossils is that you can look at them kind of the way that we look at trees. 
And so, for example, this big limb bone that's behind me here, this is the arm bone from a long neck dinosaur. And what paleontologists will do is take a slice out of this arm bone, and they'll be able to count the rings in the arm bone, just as how you can age a tree by counting the number of rings that are in a tree cookie. So if I were to look at this dinosaur's arm bone and count 12 rings, I would be able to discern that this dinosaur was 12 years old when it died. And that's true for long neck dinosaurs, meat eating dinosaurs, horned dinosaurs. We can do those for all types of prehistoric critters. Very cool. I didn't know that. That's awesome. <laughs> Let's go ahead and get another question from Bridgeport Elementary. What got you interested in being a scientist? Huh. Oh, I like this question too. <laughs> what got you both interested in becoming scientists? I can go first. <laughs> so I, in science particularly, it was when I was young in elementary school, I was super interested in marine biology. So all the different animals living in the ocean was super interesting to me, which is kind of weird coming from Colorado. I don't have an ocean here, but maybe that's what made it so exciting. Um, but as I grew older, I got into biology, which is the study of life. And I got to work with all different sorts of animals. Um, and I got to take a class actually at my college at Colorado State University, where I was able to go into the field to learn how to find dinosaurs and figure out how to how they died. Um, and I went on this trip with Natalie and then some other people from the museum here and I just it was the coolest thing to me I just was so exciting there's so many questions you can ask and it just I love how there's so much of a story you know you have all these questions and you get to come up with a story about these dinosaurs like how old they were or how they died or what did they eat and that's just so exciting to me that there's so many things that we don't know yet mm. Um, wow, my, that was really nice. <laughs> um, I was just the little kid that was always outside collecting sticks and bugs and dirt and everything. And I was just kind of a collector by nature. And I went to college and I studied geology, which allowed me to spend a lot of time outside learning about the different types of rocks that are um, all across the world. And the more and more I learned about those rocks, the more and more I became interested in what was inside of those rocks, which included things like dinosaur fossils. Um, and once I learned that you could be a paleontologist and study dinosaurs for a career, I was hooked <laughs> and I just never went back. <laughs> oh, great stories. I'm sure there's so many people in the audience who are also loving science and they like collecting things and exploring. And so it sounds like there's some really good ways to end up in a lab like this mm -hmm. or a different lab someday if you have those curiosities and you pursue them. So great question. Let's get another question from the classroom. What kind of habitat do sauropods live in? <gasps> what kind of habitat did sauropod dinosaurs live in? Um, well, Great question. Uh, just as Alex had showed you a little bit earlier today, we had looked at a bunch of fern fossils and we have ferns that are still alive today. If you're out hiking around in any kind of forested area and you look around towards your feet and your ankles, there's probably a fern growing down there. Uh, so a lot of these long neck dinosaurs were living in kind of swampy, marshy, forested areas, uh, which was really great for them because that was right by where their food source was. Mm -hmm. Um, these dinosaurs in particular that are behind me came from kind of an ancient uh, lake system, which is what the Morrison is known as. So you can think of um, a bunch of rivers and streams flowing into a bunch of small lakes that would have been around the landscape. Good question. Cool. Um, what's another question from the classroom? Yes. How old is the biggest dinosaur you know? How old is the di how old is the most dinosaur you found? What is the oldest dinosaur you found? Ooh, Ooh good question. Um I oh my goodness, a long time ago have dug up some rocks from northwestern Texas that were from the late Triassic. So much, much older than any of these long neck dinosaurs that are on the table here. But during that work, we collected a lot of the dinosaurs that walk around on two feet. 
um, that are really similar to meat eating dinosaurs. So similar to this guy that's on the table, but much, much, much smaller. So think about something that's like the size of a corgi. <laughs> so um, there's a bunch of dinosaurs that are kind of in that general part of the world in New Mexico and Texas that are of that same age. And those guys are about, oh goodness, like 220 million years old. So they're pretty, they're back there in geologic time. <laughs> they're old ones. That is super old. Great question. <laughs> Um, I would like to go ahead and I'm going to give you some questions from the chat just because we're getting so many. Um, what state in the U.S. has the most fossils? <laughs> wow. Um, that is a I don't know that anyone knows the answer to that question, but um, if you're thinking about the most dinosaur fossils, I suppose, um, I would say states like Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah. So pretty much all of these states that are kind of in the Rocky Mountain region uh, have the most dinosaur fossils. And that's just because they have rocks that are the right age to have dinosaur fossils in them. When dinosaurs were alive, they walked across the entire North American continent. But if we go to a place like Chicago or Indiana, they just don't have rocks there that are, of the, that are of the right age. They've been eroded over time and all of the rocks got scraped away by the glaciers and there's no more dinosaur record there anymore. Mm -hmm. So they were there. We just don't have evidence that they were there. Yeah. Something cool to add on to this too. One of the amazing things about the museum is that we have fossils from all over these places in the U.S., but we also have fossils from Madagascar. So some of the fossils that we have out here today, like this tiny little toe bone that we have here, is actually from Madagascar. And we get to work with different scientists who come and visit us from Madagascar too, um, and who are setting up their own preparation back there. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Good call. Kind of sad to think about. There were so many that we don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. I know. It also goes to show that maybe future scientists can figure out yes. some of these answers someday that we can't. Yes. Please. <laughs> um, relating to how we can keep track of the information, one class is asked, do you have a journal that you keep track of your dinosaurs in? <laughs> Well, I do. <laughs> so a lot of paleontologists and scientists in general will keep field journals. And um, so you can write all sorts of things in here, like what you're doing that day, what you had for breakfast, but you can also write things in there like where you're visiting and what did you find? So I have all sorts of things written in my field journal about different things I was finding and different turtle textures too is something that I find really useful to have in my field journal because there's Lots of dinosaur fossils, but there's also so many turtle fossils, and we're able to identify those as well. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, you kind of forget that there are other things fossilized, too. I love that you showed us, for example, the fern earlier. Mm -hmm. and I know there was a crocodile in here a while ago. Yeah. So there's a lot of different things to find, which is pretty neat. Um, here is kind of a twofold question regarding weight, and I'm pulling mm. from a couple different mm. classes. One, what dinosaur weighed the most? And two, how much food did they eat <laughs> and weight? <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so the dinosaurs that were the heaviest weight wise would have been the long neck dinosaurs. We have some of those dinosaurs uh, here in North America. Some are pieces of them are even on the table behind me. So we talked about this rib at the very beginning of the broadcast here. And this is from a dinosaur called Apatosaurus, which is one of these giant long neck dinosaurs that walked across the Rocky Mountain region, you know, 150 million years ago. But even more so down in South America, there are a bunch of long neck dinosaur fossils that have been recovered down there. And we talked about Argentinosaurus at the beginning when we had the poll with you all. And we talked about 14 African elephants being how heavy this dinosaur was. And Argentinosaurus is considered one of the largest long neck dinosaurs. Um, and it comes from, not surprisingly, Argentina. Um, but you guys are, I feel like had a good, I don't know, guess at the beginning of this about what dinosaurs were the biggest. And we learned a little bit about that right at the beginning of the program. Very cool. And they probably would have oh. eaten a ton of food, right? Oh yeah. Sorry. I forgot. Yes. <laughs> um, oh my goodness. Yeah. I know that there have been a bunch of studies and estimates about how much dinosaurs would have had to consume to sustain their body weight and sustain their metabolism and everything. And I've heard estimates from, you know, one cubic meter of food, which was like one giant moving box worth of food that they would have had to eat every hour to sustain their body weight, which is remarkable to think about. <laughs> Very cool. Those are great questions. Um, here's kind of another twofold question, and this one's forward thinking. 
Um, do you think dinosaurs could ever come back uh, or be repopulated? And will chickens ever evolve into dinosaurs? <laughs> Reverse evolution. That's a really good question. <laughs> so I don't think dinosaurs will ever come back. Uh, these bones are so old that they're no longer bones. They're completely mineralized. So when you see movies like Jurassic Park and they're getting DNA, there isn't actually DNA coming from dinosaurs. There is DNA that can come from a little bit younger stuff like mammoths. Um, but amber actually isn't if you've seen Jurassic Park, it can't actually um, maintain DNA. The DNA will break down. So unfortunately, no, we won't see any more dinosaurs other than the birds that we currently have, which are dinosaurs. Um, and the other question was about chickens becoming dinosaurs. <laughs> well, chickens already are dinosaurs. Um, but kind of a fun fact, there is so chickens don't have teeth but there's actually a gene that we can edit in chickens where they will grow teeth just like dinosaurs did. Um, because when these animals are developing in their eggs, they're developing the same way that dinosaurs developed in eggs. So we see similar traits in chicken embryos that we would see in dinosaur embryos. And there's a lot of really cool research that's being done with that. That is very cool. <laughs> This is a quick plug for one of our past programs. If you have more questions about how birds and dinosaurs are related, we do have recordings on our YouTube of T-Rex to Turkey, where we talk to another paleontologist and an ornithologist from the museum, and they talk about how we know birds are related to dinosaurs, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. Very mm -hmm. cool. So at this point, we don't have a ton of time left. So I would really like to just kind of ask like a, a general question of both of you. Um, what words do you want to leave our students with today? Um, of inspiration or, or just fun facts? Um, how do you want to end today's program? You've shared so many amazing things, but one last bit of information I would love to have. Yeah, I think the one last thing I'd say is that, um, you know, both Alex and I have these really exciting kind of entry point stories into getting into science. And all of that had to do with just being really curious and going out exploring. And I think that there's a lot to be said about what you can find in your own backyard, especially here in Denver. You know, folks always joke about, oh, dig up a dinosaur in your backyard. And that's something that is actually possible living in the Denver metro area um, and even in the state of Colorado in general. So I encourage you guys stay curious and um, just keep exploring the natural world around you. Absolutely. I think that's a perfect summation, Natalie. Um, I would just maybe add to that. Stay open minded. Like I was super interested in ocean science and now I'm working with dinosaurs. So just keep asking different questions. And if you have something that's leading you in a different direction, explore that and follow that. So very cool. Well, Thank you so much for joining us today. Your questions were incredible. Um, I wish we had had more time to answer more of them. There were so many cool ones. Thank you all our classes who were on camera or just posting the chat. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Natalie. Um, thank you, Kim, Asa, Riley, Eduardo, Evan. We've got a ton of people behind the scenes that you aren't seeing, but they are making the magic of this program happen. Um, this has been such a treat. What a cool space. Please come visit us at the museum. And if you enjoy today's program, come back next month. It's only two weeks away, but this time we are going to be doing Scientists in Action, Lucy in the Sky with Asteroids, mm -hmm. where we talk to scientists who are not studying fossils here on Earth, but more kind of a celestial fossil as we ask, where did our, our solar system come from? And how is NASA and Southwest Research Institute answering these questions? So thank you again. This has been so fun. We can't wait to see you next time. And keep exploring. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>